Good morning. <laughs> uh, I have to do a redo. Sorry of any of you that might have listened. I think there was only one listener to yesterday's uh, addition to my sharings and had a problem with the microphone. Apparently, I had the lavalier too close to my throat and I've adjusted it and I'm trying again today. <laughs> One of the things that I don't like doing is revisiting, redoing something that I'd already felt like I completed. It's not one of my favorite activities. But this particular, today's sharing is a very important one to me. So here goes. I'll attempt to redo it in my unique manner, which may mean, which may mean that it's not too close to what I did yesterday. But the theme will be there. I hope to develop the theme. And I remember I started out by talking about some of my early propensities. It seemed that I could read people at a very young age. Read them in the sense of knowing who best to avoid, who best to consider a more intimate friendship, which means that I started sharing my inner dialogue, my inner observations, the real me. I've always been also a kind of a chameleon. There hasn't been anywhere I've ever found myself that I couldn't fit in, at least temporarily, at least fit in long enough to extricate myself from this situation if possible. This allowed me to work, to go to school, to function in the greater society, even though I always felt far removed. Not exactly a part of what was always going on around me. Kind of marched to the beat of a different drummer. But I had this uncanny ability to read people, to understand them at just a cursory glance. And if it's turned out that they came closer where I could feel them in my aura, this became clearer and filled in with more details to the point that I was accused of being a mind reader, a psychic. How do I know their innermost thoughts, their innermost secrets many times, their greatest sorrows a lot of the times, the source of worry for them. And because I was always more interested in the other than myself, I spent a lot of time in this process, reading, most times without any interaction. But when it came time to interact, I could read them, certainly never claimed to have a psychic bone in my body, never claim to be a fortune teller, mind reader. <laughs> That's really funny to me. But simply through observation, listening, close attention, looking for their tells, as they say in poker, looking for them to indicate to express some innermost part of their being through gestures, through
through demeanor, through the way they breathe, through their body posture, how they held themselves, eye contact. And here was most important to me, eyes, the windows to the soul. Everything that can be known or needs to be known in the human being is available through their eyes. Now, true sociopaths are able to mask, much harder to read, but everything above me is repelled and I never had really close contact with a sociopath. So I never really encountered anyone that I couldn't get a feel for. And this served me well because I knew who to avoid. This was almost an immediate repulsion. I didn't even have to engage them. And the few times I engaged people that turned out to be less than what I had originally perceived or betrayed me or lied to me or tricked me, quickly close the door. This person is out, no longer in my sphere, my sphere of acquaintances. And also, I was quick to see who might become a confidant somebody that I could let in, somebody that I not only trusted, but that I cared for, let them in to pretty much an elite inner circle. My inner circle has never included more than five, normally around two or three people that I will share my feelings with, people that I will talk to, people that I will begin to share, let them have glimpses of what makes me tick, the things that are important to me. So this inner circle, and I'm always looking to expand the inner circle, but life has told me taught me to date that three to five is a good number and I should count myself as a lucky being having this amount of close confidence. And this was my propensity as I grew up. And when my progressive awakening transformed to permanent awakening, I have found that there is less and less, maybe two in my life as I speak to you now. A brother and a wife. And even these two, I tend to keep my own counsel. I'm careful what I say because I'm really aware of the impact. As a younger man, I didn't have this skill. There was a short path to travel from inspiration, observation, to mouth, to vocalizing. And was always in the spirit of complete honesty. Then 
I would do this. Even not at a price, knowing that most people were not very receptive or even to resented anything that I might see about them and tell them. And usually, first I would tell the observation and then I might suggest, depending on their reaction, how they might possibly deal with this. What are some things that they could tweak or change or attempt to change that might make it an easier go? All of this, by the way, was always motivated for concern of the other, long-term concern, concern about their soul path, concern about their awakening process, and short-term, shocking, repelling. Didn't really enter my consciousness as my words could be seen as cutting. I never, it was never my intent to offer cutting, cutting insights. It was always through the motivation of wanting to help others. In fact, this has been my motivating, my means of propulsion into the day-by-day -day progression of life that I find myself a witness to and a part of at the same time. But helping people, healing through my words, words of insight, words of possibilities, It took me a long time to understand that, number one, it was at a huge cost to me personally. Very much energy was diverted, was devoted to the process of attempting to heal others, to help others to inspire others, took a tremendous toll on me personally, as we all have only a limited amount of energy at our disposal, which seems to lessen as we age. So this was my motivation in life. But this was also my life task to learn how to increase the time from here to here. It was almost instantaneous. That's my want, that's my propensity, my tendency is to spit it out. And as we all know, even though my motivation for doing so was based on good intentions. But somewhere there's a maxim about good intentions pave the way to hell. <laughs> so trying to first identify the problem and this just took time and experience when I saw that the majority of the people that I gifted <laughs> with my insight didn't take it too well. Some told me they felt naked before me as if I knew their innermost secrets. But this wasn't what I was doing. I was just reading what they project, just being interested, available, 
and able to hear what they were really communicating and try to help no matter how direct and sometimes brutal my words could be. Again, the attention was to help, to heal, not to hurt. But I knew that based on experience, based on results, this is something that I really needed to work on. So here's a prime directive, a prime motivation for me, observing, listening, and attempting to help by, by verbalizing what I saw, felt, and ultimately understood about these people. And at the same time, I developed an interest in systems. Being a very systematic thinker, creating my own systems, but mostly examining existing systems, looking for where they fall short, looking for fallacies. And most of my th inner thinking was devoted to looking at systems, looking at existing systems. I had an interest in astrology at a very young age, looking to celestial events and their influence on us as human beings. This became much, very much a hobby to me, always interested, looking for the truth, looking past that simple astrology column that we might see in the newspaper, focusing on just the sun sign, which is, after all, only reflective of your personality, your inner being, you have to look deeper, your inner motivations, you have to consider much more than is offered in a simple daily astrology reading. Most of the time, it was random, one size fits all. But there was a certain truth and relevancy that I saw in astrology because examining the system supported my observations, my insights, my thirst for increasing information through reading led me to find some truth within the realms of astrology. Some things rang true, but it was never beyond, I never made a decision, I never based on anything on astrology as far as my personal behavior. I just looked for causal events. I just looked for relationships, just built the system, connected the dots, connecting sometimes apparent disparage information, finding commonalities. It's a gift I had and collecting them, connecting them, filing them, storing them. Con constructing a web of contact, of similarities, a way to make this information accessible, to not take up 
too much space in my memory faculties. So this is an interest that started early and has stayed with me. And there was many other systems that I discarded along the way. But this is one that I kept with the caveat, the important caveat that I remember in my daily pe newspaper when I was a young man, it said underneath, what's the disclaimer it said, for this astrology information is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> well, how perfect because this was my source of entertainment. This is how I entertain myself by reflecting, by considering, by extending these systems to a conclusion and determining that if that was a useful, helpful, positive conclusion or is something that needed to be discarded. So I never spend too much time on what I've discarded. I couldn't begin to tell you what systems I spent time examining and since have discarded. Wouldn't be very useful. Discarded for me, once I empty that trash bin of discarded information, the space is freed up for consideration, evaluation of new paradigms, of new systems. And I became aware of about 10 years ago, a system called human design. I was introduced by a man here in Taiwan, Deepak, who had the, who was a close associate for many years to Osho and was the official astrologer for the Songha, for Osho's Songha, his family that was in the tens, hundreds of, tens to hundreds of thousands of followers. And Deepak was quite active spent many, many years in Pune, India, sharing his insights to his system. And one of the things that legitimized me is that he's a PhD from Louisiana in psychology. So as I put value on academic observation, he was a step beyond most astrologers simply by because of what he studied and his devotion and energy that's reflected in his obtaining a PhD. Well, on a trip to Thailand, I met a dear friend of Deepak's. Tom, Tom from Netherlands. Tom told me, when I told him I'm from Taiwan, he says, you must know Deepak. And I said, well, sorry, you know, Taiwan has 23 million people and I know very few. And he said, well, you must look him up when you get back to Taiwan. So I did, I called him within a few days. And I said, I'd like to set an appointment. Where are you? And he said, where am I? And I said, well, I'm in a northern city, Siko city called Jilong. And I'd like to set up an appointment with you. And he said, Dennis, I'm 20 minutes away. So within 20 minutes, I had my first introduction to Deepak, where he introduced me to human design. And as soon as I saw my chart, a new system was born. I spent hours and not and invested money, time, 
and effort to examining this system. And I found it beautiful because it included other systems that I looked at. It included my beloved astrology, uh, the Kabbalah, which I was a little bit familiar from, a little bit familiar with, the I Ching, which I was, was very familiar with, and some elements of numerology, another system that I had looked at and still find numbers significant, as I've mentioned, 33, fours and eights are always meaningful numbers, catch my attention. So I found out the founder, Ra Guru Hu, was inspired by the 1987 supernova. He spent eight days in a meditative state, receptive state, receiving the system. And it's a very, very elaborate system. Uh, as deep as I've studied, there was always more, more depth. It was on so many levels. But he, Ra talked about neutrinos coming from this supernova nova event. And I've mentioned neutrinos and how we're constantly bombarded by them. But everybody, however long it took the neutrinos, which travel slightly less than the speed of light, to reach us, all of us were received, all of us on Earth received the same information. So, for whatever reason, Ra seemed to be chosen, singled out. Much to his chagrin, as I said, he fancied himself more of a realist. He didn't really buy into any uh, new agey, even spiritual stuff. He was m more a scientist in persuasion and demeanor, personality. But here he was, gifted through this supra-ordinary process where a voice talked to him for eight days. Eight days of suffering. It wasn't a pleasant la-la-la experience for him. But anyway, look into it, human design. Much more briefly, another system that I've been attracted to is the Meyer-Briggs type index that designates 16 different types of personalities. And again, I dove deeply into this and found out I was a INFJ. And everything resonated for me. It's a very useful description, very accurate. And none of the three systems that have become particularly important to me enjoy universal scientific support. There's a lot of naysayers out there. But although I'm familiar with their arguments, it doesn't stop me from building my systematic web for finding things that not only fit, but finding a place for things that don't at first glance lend themselves to fitting. So we talked about my insight into people, my love with systems. And here, I finally want to get to what the meat, the heart of the matter is for what I'm sharing today. And that is building a community. Building a community of like-minded souls. 
building a community that meditation, exercise, practice is inherent part of the community. Zen Healing Center was the name that came to me many, many years ago. And I actually see it in my mind, see it in a physical existence here in Taiwan, somewhere near Hualien, somewhere between Hualien and Taidong, at the southernmost part of the island, along the coast, coast and mountains, being a Hawaii spirit, beautiful mountains, and the coast nearby, this environment. And part of my vision of this community is that time and place, when it's correct, someone will gift me with the lands, the land to physically place it on. The rest will be up to me. And I've had many, many visions of how to begin, how to construct. But I also am here to tell you that these efforts that I put into this YouTube experience has been dedicated to the same premise of building a community. And it's slow going. <laughs> I don't have a lot of followers or watchers yet, but I will continue doing this because if I can reach one person, that is complete success. I talked of 150 people as being the ideal size of a group. If I had 150 like-minded people around me, that would be paradise. But I'm also willing to see what time will bring. Perhaps this community on the internet, on my YouTube channel, is really the foundation of the beginnings of my community. But it's really important that I share these things because it's been a logical progression, but based on insights, based on revelations, based on what the Blue Buddha has shared with me, that my voice can have a healing effect on those who are called to listen. One couldn't ask for any more. <laughs>